Oh, good, morning. good morning. Let's open your Bible to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and then Luke chapter 7. Find verse 11 when you get there. And we'll read oh, about eight verses here to start. Luke 7, we'll read 11 through 18. Everybody there? Just about. Luke 7, 11. Bible says, and it came to pass the day after that he, and that's Jesus, he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. And the disciples of John showed him, all, showed him of all these things. Would you say we just read about a miracle? Did you see that's a man that rose from the dead and it's because of the work and power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you notice the mention of the mother of this young man or this, this man? And we're going to say a few things about mothers this morning being Mother's Day, but I just happened to come across this in my reading this week and it jumped out at me and obviously for a reason for this morning. And... I don't know that this is a key text for preachers on Mother's Day, but why not? I don't see a problem with it. So a mother's mentioned, and there's a lot of real good application for all of us. So let's pray, and then we'll dig into our message with the Lord's help. Lord God, we call on you in the name of Jesus Christ. We are certain that we have no ability to understand or apply what we read on our own. And we lean on you, we call on you for help this morning. May these scriptures truly be what they are to you. May it be to us what they are to you. May they be alive, may they be powerful. Help us all to open our hearts and allow you to do the work on our hearts we need done. And I pray that you'd really help our mothers today to be greatly encouraged. Thank you for them, all of them that are here, all of them listening. We're just so grateful for the usage of mothers in the lives of children. And we just pray that today your word goes forth the way that you desire to powerfully and your work get, get accomplished that you desire today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the man named John Killinger wrote the following concerning mothers and some things from the Bible. Here's what he said, quote, I believe in Jesus Christ, the son of the loving, the loving God who was born of the promise to a virgin named Mary. I believe in the love Mary gave her son that caused her to follow him in his ministry and stand by his cross as he died. I believe in the love of all mothers and its importance in the lives of the children they bear. It is stronger than steel, softer than down, and more resilient than a green sapling on the hillside. It closes wounds, melts disappointments, and enables the weakest child to call and straight in the fields of adversity. Uh, I have to stop for just a moment in the quote. Praise the Lord for mothers. As I'm reading, I'm thinking about times where my mom helped me in a disappointing time in my life. And I went to mom instead of dad at certain times, on purpose. Other times I go to dad instead of mom, but there was times where mom was the one that would give me the help I needed. Anytime I got hurt as a little boy, it wasn't dad who got the Band-Aid and the peroxide out. It was mom. 
And if dad had tried to help me out, he could have done it, but he would have done as well as mom. Moms have a way of doing things that only moms can do them as well as they do. So let me go on here. Continue on with John Quillinger. Quote, a uh, Quillinger. Quote, I believe that this love, even at its best, is only a shadow of the love of God, a dark reflection of all that we can expect of him, both in this life and the next. And I believe that one of the most beautiful sights in the world is a mother who lets this greater love flow through to her child, blessing the world with the tenderness of her touch and the tears of her joy, end quote. It's a great thing when you have a mother who's godly, who passes her love for Jesus Christ down to her children. I'm a product of that. Anybody with me? Anybody have a godly mother that passed on so many godly qualities down to you? And I know that we're not, our relationship with God is not based on our mothers as far as being saved, but they can have a great influence on salvation they had a big influence on a young man named Timothy, his mother and his grandmother, in getting saved. If you read uh, the books that Paul wrote to Timothy, you find that out. And they can also have a great effect on a young person's, or an older person's, spiritual growth. Praise God for mothers that are used by God to nurture their children both physically and spiritually. Amen? So I got to thinking about some things pertaining to mothers, and this is just an introduction. We'll get into the text in a moment. But the bond formed between a mother and child is amazing. That's not a very good word to use, but I'll just say amazing. So a, a certain scripture came to mind when I was thinking about what a mother does just, show, just so that she can be called a mother. This thing called childbirth. Go to John chapter 16. John 16. And go down to verse 21, and you'll see something about childbirth that, uh, since I'm a man looking at this, I, it is just amazing to me that a woman is willing to have a child. And here's why. Look at verse 21. 1621. A woman, when she is in travail, hath what? Okay, now time out. I'll finish the verse in a minute. But let's, let's time out for a moment. A woman knows that she has pain coming in order to have a child, have a son or a daughter, right? She knows that there's pain on the way, yet she's okay with that. That's an amazing thing. And now here's something else. Now, Sam is back in the back there. She's already had one and had to endure the pain. And she's okay. She's totally okay with doing that again. That is very telling. My mother... I'm the youngest of two, so she had my sister. They gave her all kinds of trouble. From the, I mean, not very long after she was born. She was, she was a rebel child. And they were willing to have another one and take a chance. And I had my rebellious moments as well. That is amazing to me that a mother knows. She knows there will be sorrow attached to childbirth. And there will be sorrow attached to just being a mother when the child doesn't do what she's, he or she's told to do, right? Yet, the mother is okay with that. Look at why. The verse will tell us. A woman, when she's in travail, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish. Why is that? For joy that a man is born into the world. The joy comes, but not until after the sorrow and it's an amazing thing to me that a, a woman, a mother, is okay with the sorrow because she knows what's on the other side of the sorrow. What's on the other side, folks? Joy. And I mean, I, you've seen it. A newborn baby with his mother. That mother is so happy, his or her mother. That, that, that baby, uh, whether it be a, a son or a daughter, that mother is so happy. And I, if you're like me and you kind of look at babies and they talk about how beautiful babies are, I always, go, always have a furrowed eyebrow like, what? They're not always beautiful. But it doesn't matter to the mother, does it? It doesn't matter what that baby looks like. Some of the babies when, when they uh, are first born kind of look alien-like, don't they? But that don't matter to the mother. That mother is happy. Two things. Number one, the sorrow's over. 
Number two, I have joy because of I was willing to endure the sorrow and look what I have now. Amen? So I think there's something to the attachment of her, a mother to her child that comes as a result of enduring that sorrow, but getting on the other side of that sorrow and having that bundle of joy, that baby. So it's just a neat thing. It's a fascinating thing. Childbirth is a miracle, isn't it? I could preach a sermon. Uh, we got some medical people here. They could tell you all about the, the details. It's unexplainable. Medical people, when it really comes down to how that works, uh, a lot of little details there that it's just, it's an amazing thing. It's a miraculous thing. And obviously it's the work of God. It's not the work of natural processes or evolutionary processes. God is the one behind the miracle of childbirth. Okay, so let's go back to Luke chapter 7. Let's dig in here. If you notice, we've got an unnamed mother. She does not have a name in this passage. But I think that maybe the reason why she's unnamed is the Lord wants all mothers to identify with what she goes through here. And I think there's a greater application than just mothers. But since it's Mother's Day, I think there's something special here pertaining to mothers. Now look at verse 11. And it came to pass the day after they went into a city called what? Nain. Now I am told that the word Nain means pleasant. So here we are in a place that's called Pleasant, Nain. And if you read the rest of verse 11, everything's great. Many of his disciples went with him and much people. Verse 11, everything is pretty peachy. You got the Lord Jesus Christ going to this place named Pleasant, and his disciples are with him. There's a lot of people following him. Everything's great. But then look what they come upon in verse 12. It says, now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, Behold, there was a what? A dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. So point number one this morning, a dead son. First thing, let's discuss. Now, you know how your Bible's laid out. You have to get through the negative before you get to the positive. So this is how this message is laid out. It'll be rough at first, but we'll get to some good stuff at the end. So a dead son, and we are not told how old this man was. We're not told how he died. All we know from the text is that there's a woman who had a son, and this son is being carried to his burial. You'll notice the word beer down in verse 14, B-I-E-R. That's a coffin, but back in these days, it would be an open type coffin where you could actually see, still see the body. So I want to spend a few moments talking about this dead son, and here's why. Death has impacted everybody in this room today in one way or another. Now, you're still alive. You haven't faced death yet, but everybody in here knows probably multiple people that were close to you, maybe even, that have died. Now, my parents are still living. Uh, I have a sister. She's, she's still alive, doing well. Uh, I have had grandparents die. I've had friends pass away. In the last few years, probably the, the, the most just difficult to process is kids I taught have died. I don't understand that. I mean, we had, had a young man that I saw at a store. About a year after I saw him, uh, I found out that he, that he died. Not even 30 years old, I don't think. And then at my school, there's been from one particular class, uh, I want to say it's 2008 or 9, there's been three, and these are younger people here, they, they're, they're probably uh, 30, early 30s, late 20s, that have died. And most recently, one uh, died of cancer. That's not supposed to happen, but it happens, doesn't it? And death is something we're going to talk about for a moment this morning, and here's why. It's a reality. And rather than focusing on the fact that we will all die one day, I'll get there in a moment, let's just talk about how we all are going to have situations in our life where we are faced with the death of somebody we know. And it's not easy, is it? You've been to a funeral? Funerals of saved people can be a very joyous thing. We've had a few here uh, in the last couple of years where we know for certain that person's saved. At the same time, it's tough moving on without people that you're used to seeing all the time, isn't it? 
Now I want you to consider the plight of this woman. Notice it says there, we got a good detail here in verse 12. It says, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and look what else we see here. She was a what? She's a widow, and much people of the city was with her. Okay, so we have a dead son. Second thing I'd like to talk about is we also have a grieving mother. We have a grieving mother. So notice this woman has already lost her husband. Now she's lost her son. Can you think of anybody else in the Bible who's a widow and then her son, in this case, there's another woman, her son's plural die. Can you think of anybody like that in your Bible? Anybody? Go over to the book of Ruth. Let's take a look at this for a moment. Ruth chapter 1. Now, while you're turning over there, let's make sure. I'm pretty sure we're on the same page with this, but I have to say it. Why is it, folks, please feel free to answer aloud. Why is it that we have to deal with death? Why do people die? The wages of sin is death. That's the first part of Romans 6.23. Romans 3.10, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Next time you pass a cemetery, it ought to be a reminder. Death is real, and sin is the reason why people die. Now, I'm 50. Man, I tell you, it, that, I know it's only a number, but I was 49 at some point last year. And I thought to myself, five, zero. Five's the number of death. Five times ten. I'm a Gentile. Ten's the number of Gentiles. Five's the number of death. Man. And I, the reason why it hit me, 40 was not so bad, but 50, I thought, 20 more years, and that's 70? And, and I'll be greatly blessed if I reach 70. My dad's 82. I'm not guaranteed that. And it just really hit me to think about, I'm getting, I've probably already lived more years than I have remaining. There's a good chance of that, right? I mean, mo most people don't live to be 100. So I've already lived more years than I have left. That's a sobering thought. And I think it's good that we consider where we are in life when it comes to age, to consider how much time you might, I say might have left, because I'd like to think I got 20 more. I don't know that. You say the Lord's going to come back before 20 more years. I hope so, but I don't know that. I mean, the year 2050 could roll around, and the Lord hadn't returned yet, maybe. So we need to understand that we, let's talk about us sitting here this morning, just for a moment here. We all will die if the Lord tarries his return in the clouds. You know that? Now, before we talk more about this woman, I want to ask you, do you know well, let me just ask you, I'll frame it in a question. Is death the end of you? You need to know that. Death is not the end of you or me. In fact, the time after you die is far longer than the time you're alive. Think about that for a moment. Consider the time after you die that you will still exist is far longer than the time that you're alive down here on earth. It's measurable down here, isn't it? Years and months and days. After you die, there's no measure of time. And you go on and on forever. And don't be deceived into thinking that if you just live a good life, you're going to go to heaven after you die. That's a lie. That's one of the biggest lies. I'm telling you, there's so many Americans. I, mean, I live in America, so I know Americans better than the rest of the world. So many Americans today really think if I live a good life, better than most, I'll go to heaven. That's a bold-faced lie, folks. That is such a lie. We're all sinners. We will die. We all deserve to pay for our own sins. Big sinners, little sinners. Young sinners, old sinners. Male sinners, female sinners. We all deserve hell. We deserve to pay for our sins. Let's be honest. That's what we all deserve. You say, I've been going to church all my life. That doesn't mean a thing when it comes to eternity. Church is a place where hopefully you'll hear the truth about how you can be saved, but going to church and checking boxes, oh, three times in 30 years, that doesn't get you to heaven. 
You need to understand that. I love the fact we got a good crowd today. Praise God that there's this many people in a Bible-believing church in this day and age. Amen. But you coming here does nothing for your soul when it comes to eternity and guaranteeing heaven. You know that, right? If you don't know that, you do need to know that. God's established the church to be the, pil the, church to be the pillar and ground of the truth. So let me tell you the truth here. The wages of sin is death. The rest of that verse, Romans 6, says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you can know for certain that when you breathe your last breath here, here you'll be in a much better place where there's no sin. Amen? Amen? There's no stinking American politics. Amen? Amen. There's no inflation. <laughs> Nothing wears out. You don't have to buy a new car. You don't have to worry about how much money's in your bank account if you can pay the mortgage or pay for your whatever it is. You don't have to worry about your 401k, amen, right? Which is probably in the tank right now. You don't have to worry about any of that anymore. Here's why. All that is only tied to this earth. And heaven is far better than this place we're living on right now, amen? Now let me tell you the reality of something. There's a place called heaven. If you have called on Jesus Christ to be your Savior, knowing that he died and rose again for you, you're guaranteed when you pass from this life to the next, you'll be in heaven. Amen? John 5, 24 is a great verse on that, being passed from death to life. Now think about it. We think that death means no more life. But a saved person, you're passed from death to life. You know why? You'll be in the presence of the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. The Lord Jesus Christ. He's up there right now, isn't he? You'll be with him. So I got to be honest with you and tell you the truth. There's also another place, and there's only two places that a person could go when they die. Luke 16, if you want to, you don't have to turn over there now. You want to look at that on your own. But it says over there, there's a rich man. And it says that the rich man died and was buried. And the next thing it says is, in hell... He lift up his eyes being in torment. And you find out that there's a real place called hell, and it is nothing desirable by anybody that's alive and honest. Any of you do any cooking? Anybody do cooking out there? Surely some folks out there. Okay. You ever open the oven after you heat it up to 450 degrees? You ever do that? I'll tell you, I don't cook very often. Sherry does the cooking. I don't cook very often. But occasionally I have to heat up a, a pizza or something. You know, I've got to cook a pizza for all, all things. And I got I to gotta turn the oven up to four, 400, 450, whatever it is. And that, I'll set, I'll set it to, to, to go off on a timer or on an on a, a, a alarm whenever it's up to where it should be. I open up that oven. And what, what do you feel? I mean, it just comes on you, doesn't it? And if you're down like this, you'll go, whoa. And the Lord uses that just about every time I open the oven to say, you think that's hot? Oh, and you got out of it just like that. You just had to back off. In hell, there's no relief. The man in hell, you know what he wanted? The rich man in hell, the first thing, he, the only thing he asked for was, what, what was it, folks? Something to drink, water. And it wasn't even a drink. It was a drop. So now, let's, let's connect some dots here. You find out Jesus Christ is on the cross. You know, one of the final things he said, he said several things right before he died that are very profound. One of the things he said is, I thirst. Identifying with a rich man, that rich man who was in hell in torments. Now, I don't believe that Jesus burned in hell. I'm not saying that at all, but I, I do know this. He suffered God's wrath on the cross. He suffered the torment that you and I deserve in going to hell. And because he did that, he made a way for sinners who deserve hell to be saved. Amen? Amen. So that's the reality of that dead son, and that's the reality of what this grieving mother was dealing with. Loss. And I want to just talk about this mother for a moment. Go to Ruth chapter 1. You only have to read a few verses here, and you find out that Ruth and this woman over in Luke have a lot in common here. So let's talk about this grieving mother for a moment and this other grieving mother here in Ruth. Verse 1, and it came to, now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Okay, everything's peachy so far, right? You got a man, his wife, two sons, 
They're just moving, going from one place to the next. Verse 2, and the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the name of his two sons Malon and Kileon, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. Now, how's everything going so far, folks? Everything's okay. Look at verse 3, though. Watch what happens. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Okay, so you have this woman, Naomi. She's now a widow. Hey, at least she's got her sons, though. At least she's got somebody close to help her, and they're, they're young men at this point. Look at verse 4. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The, name of one, the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there about 10 years. Okay, now, we just happen to be in verse 5, and look what happens in verse 5. And Milon and Kileon, what happened to them? Died also both of them, and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. I believe God put that in the Old Testament on purpose. Go back to Luke chapter 7. Here you have a woman over here in the New Testament that has the same thing. You've got a loss of a husband. You've got the loss of a son. And I'll just say this about this grieving mother. And anybody who's grieved over a loss, the loss of a loved one, when tragedy strikes like this, the easiest thing to do is to do like Ruth did. We didn't read it, but you can read about what Ruth, or uh, not Ruth, Naomi. Naomi, after her husband and her sons died, she became very, very, anybody know? Bitter. When tragedy strikes, it's really easy to become bitter. Questions like this come up. God, why? Why did you let this happen? God, why me? What did I do to deserve this? And let me take a look at, let's all take a look at verse 12. I want to show you something that is present in verse 12 that is good, but is still no help to this woman. If you look in verse 12, dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Look at this little detail. And much people of the city was with her. Notice that, much people of the city was with her. That indicates to me that this mother, this grieving mother, had the support of many people, possibly friends and family members. I want you to notice something, though. And this is true anytime there's a loss of a loved one. All the people that were with her could do was just be there. That's it. And I know... There's people that try to give words of consolation, but if you've ever been through something like this or watched somebody go through a real tragedy with death, what you watch happen is people are coming along saying, I'm so sorry, I'm praying for you, and the person is just, they don't, they don't change expression at all, and you can tell. They're having a rough time with it, and everything somebody says, it's just going right through them, or they don't even hear them because they're so focused on the tragedy that has struck I think that's normal, by the way. I think that's just normal human response whenever tragedy strikes. All they could do, all these people could do was be there for her. And I, I do want to say this. If you know somebody going through a time of grief, you still do need to be there for them, whether they respond to you or not. Amen? Amen. And it may seem like it's going right through them what you say, or maybe they don't even hear you what they say. But if they don't hear you, you still need to be there for them, and you need to pray for them. Amen? God is the only one that can bring the comfort that people need during a time of tragedy when it comes to death of dear loved ones. So you need people like that. It's a gift from God to have people you can lean on in times of great difficulty. Amen to that? When you go through a tough time, it's a gift from God to have people that, can, that you can lean on that can help comfort you. Praise God for that, by the way. It's nice to have people around. If you're going through it all alone, it can be a whole lot tougher. I say all that, and that's good, but I don't care how many people you have around. In this case, it didn't matter how many help this woman had around her. They could not remove the anguish and grief associated with the tragedy of the death of her son. They couldn't do anything to fix that. There is somebody that shows up, though, 
who was most definitely able to fix that. Amen? Look who shows up in verse 13. It says, and when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, weep not. Folks, all those people around, I know they probably did their best to try to console her and help her. They couldn't do anything as far as bringing back her son. But lo and behold, look who shows up when he's needed the most, who can actually do something about her son. Who is it, folks? Who shows up? The Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that nobody knows the condition of your heart better than the Lord Jesus Christ? Did you know that? We talk about the heart on Wednesday nights. Nobody knows your heart like the Lord knows it. In fact, I don't know my heart as good as the Lord does. You don't know your own, the, own, the condition of your own heart better than the Lord does. And he comes along, and look at the words that he says there at the end of verse 13. He says, weep not. Now, isn't that something? What if you went to somebody who lost a loved one, and you went up to him and you said, cut your crying out. How would that go? They might get punched in the face if you say something like that. Weep not. Weeping is part of dealing with a difficult circumstance. Amen? Crying is good for the soul. It can be very helpful, whether you're a man or a woman. Sometimes you just need to cry. I know the women probably do it more than the men, but there's, fellas, let's be honest, there's times where you just need to cry a little bit, maybe a lot, and it's helpful. And here somebody shows up and he says, weep not. Now, anytime the Lord says something, and there's times in the Gospels where I see the Lord says things, and they baffle me. I'm thinking, who is he to say that? <laughs> there's some things that he says that are really striking and will really throw you for a loop, but you have to keep reading because you figure out why he said some of the odd things that he said. So he says, weep not. Why would the Lord say that? Well, before we go on here, Keep your finger here. Go back to John 16, or go forward to John 16. We got to remember who it is that says, weep not. It's not just anybody ordinary, that's for certain. Look at John 16, and these are the words of Jesus Christ. Go down to verse 33. These are the words that were spoken by Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you, well, you want to you mark this verse because... All of us, every single one of us, it may be soon, may be later, but we're all going to deal with the loss of a loved one. We're all going to deal with tragedy and difficulty. I tell you, there's a lot of good verses you could go to. This is going to have to be near the top of the list. It'll really help you. Look at verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have what? That's Jesus talking. Isn't that what the world's looking for? They look for it in all the wrong places, but Jesus Christ is the one who can bring peace. And look what the rest of the verse says. In the world, what do you get? In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen to that. Hey, if you talk to the Lord Jesus Christ and ask him for help, you're calling on him, the one who's overcome death and the grave. He's overcome the world. Over in 1 John, it says he came to destroy the works of the devil. Now, who's giving you trouble? The devil, right? He came to destroy the works of the devil. Can't you lean on him for anything? Amen. The one who overcame death, overcame the world, can defeat the devil. He is the one. Now go back there to verse uh, Luke chapter 7. Look down there, and let's see what the Lord does here. Verse 14, right after he says, weep not. Let's talk about the compassion of the Savior. This is the last point this morning, the compassion of the Savior. He says, weep not, and then look at verse 14. And he came and touched the bier, and they that bear him stood still. Okay, so just the touch I'll tell you something interesting to study in, in the Gospels is when Jesus Christ touches somebody or when somebody touches him. You remember the woman who sought after him and said, I'm going to get to him no matter what it takes just so I can. Touch the hem of his garment. Something about contact with the Lord Jesus Christ that is powerful. Amen? So look what happens here. It says, they that bear him stood still, and he said, now you want to pay attention when the Lord speaks. He said, young man, I say unto thee, 
Now he's talking to the young man and he says one word. What is it, folks? Arise. One word spoken to a dead man. Now that's kind of strange to talk to a dead man, isn't it? But the Lord Jesus Christ is the one speaking to a dead man, so there's something to this. And when he addresses the dead man, one word, arise. Look at the next verse, 15. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. Watch the wording here. And he delivered him to his mother. Amen to that. One word made everything completely different. Changed the entire situation for this mother. Amen to that. Now, let me just address the mothers out here for a moment. Mothers, I don't, I don't we, got, we got several mothers here amongst us. I am not aiming this at anybody, so this may or may not apply, but I do know something. Children have a tendency to wander off and do whatever they want. And I'm talking about spiritually. I know because I've been there as a child and I knew what my mother and my father had taught me. I had learned the scriptures as a young man. But I, you know how the, the pull of the world is. The world just, like a magnet, attracts you and attracts you. And uh, there's a time in my life where I said, Mom and Dad really know what they're talking about. And I, I was saved. I knew the Lord. But uh, I began to wander. And I, without her ever telling me, I know without a doubt, my mom, number one, knew I was starting to wonder. And number two, you know what she did? I'll confirm this when I see her this afternoon, but I know she was doing it because she still does it to this day, and she was doing it back then. You know what mom was doing? Praying for me. And I would have conversations, oh, about once a week back when this was happening. I, I, if I was to ask her, she probably heard it in my voice. I was probably not walking with the Lord. And she prayed for me. And she prayed for me, and she continued to pray for me. Guess what? Her prayers got answered. And I, I'll just, without giving you a big testimony here, if, if you're saved and you begin to wander away from the Lord, you will be miserable. The world makes it sound like you're gonna, everything's going to be great. And you know what happened? And I believe, to me, looking back, this is just proof of the Holy Spirit working on me. Everybody I'm with is having the best time in the world. I'm doing the same thing, and I'm miserable as all get out. I'm like, what's wrong with me? You know what's wrong with me? The Holy Spirit's saying, that's no fun. That's no fun. You're going down the wrong path. They're not really having fun. It's only for a time. And you, you know this is not fun. And it didn't take long going down that path where the Lord just made me miserable. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, by the way. If you're saved and you begin to wander away, you'll be miserable. And everybody around you is going to know it, by the way. You can't hide it. And my mother, I mean, I'm, my father as well. I, I, today's Mother's Day, so I'll talk about my mom. My mom prayed for me. I don't know if we got some moms out here and you know your child or children are wayward. Hey, don't, mamas, don't stop praying for your kids. Amen? Don't, maybe it's grandkids. Maybe it's great-grandkids. Mothers, please don't stop praying for your kids. Please don't. You say, but you don't know. Do you believe in the power of the Holy Ghost? Anybody out there, do you? You believe the Holy Spirit can convict them and show them they're wrong? And by the way, the power of the Holy Spirit to show kids that they're wrong is more powerful than you telling them they're wrong oftentimes, particularly when they're older. Amen to that, right? Mamas, don't stop praying for your kids. Grandmas, don't stop praying for your grandkids. Don't stop. Keep doing it. Here's why. Luke chapter 7, you know what we have painted for us here as we end up here? You know what we have? We have an incredible picture painted for us here. You had a young man who was dead, who now has life, and the difference in him being alive rather than dead was one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have an incredible picture painted here. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Let me show it to you. Ephesians 2. Look at the picture painted here. Ephesians chapter 2. Now, this is written to save people, but you'll understand how this applies to that situation over there in Luke chapter 7. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Or 
and make sure you see this for yourself. Ephesians 2, 1. And you hath he quickened. What's that word quickened mean, folks? Made alive, never to die again. You hath he quickened. Watch the rest of the verse. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. So before you were saved, you had no spiritual life. If you've called on Jesus Christ to save you, you went from being dead in trespasses and sins to being quickened. You got life that you'll never lose because of Jesus Christ. You know what you have painted there? The picture painted there over there in Luke chapter 7? You have a picture of a young man who's dead in trespasses and sins. And he's made alive by Jesus Christ. His mother goes from incredible grief because he's dead to incredible joy because he's alive. Now, mothers, when you gave birth, it was a great thing to get on the other side of the travail to have that new life in your hands. Amen? Mothers, and I'll say fathers as well, and this is for all of us, it's a great thing when a child goes from being dead spiritually in trespasses and sins to being made alive through Jesus Christ. We call this being born again. Now, now here's something that I've observed. When babies are born, people are excited. I mean, they're so excited, and rightfully so, amen? And unfortunately, in the last, oh, many years of being in Baptist churches, somebody will walk the aisle and be saved, and many people in church are like, yeah, huh, good for them. There's more joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. Amen. Come on. The angels rejoice over there, up there. So if people get saved, that is, you should be just as excited or more excited than the birth of a baby. Amen? Because what's happened is somebody has been born again. Amen to that. 1 John 5, 12. Great verse. All one syllable. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Spiritual life comes only by believing on Jesus Christ. That he died he identified with this man right here, but he rose again. He has have the power to do that so that everybody who deserves hell because we're sinners can have our sins forgiven and have eternal life. Is, is there a, a nicer, nicer, is there a more exciting message than that? Hello, anybody out there? Amen. That's it. That's what life's all about right there. I want to ask you a few questions here as we close here. And this is for all different types of people, so uh, maybe something will apply here. And if it does apply, you, I, I'd encourage you to do business with God today. So here's the first thing I ask you. Had any grief or sorrow lately? Maybe things are going real well for you today. And I'm not trying to be a downer. I just know how this goes. Things might be going real well for you today. You're going to have a time of grief or sorrow at some point and maybe soon. And I don't say that to be a downer. I say that because it's true. And here's why, another reason why I tell you. There's only one person that can help you when you're going through grief and sorrowful times, and that is Jesus Christ. You better make sure you're right with him because going through those difficult times, can you imagine, those of you who know the Lord, can you imagine going through a tragic time without him? You understand why people do ridiculous, foolish things when they're going through times of tragedy without the Lord. People do some ridiculous things. Oftentimes they do things that are irreversible during times of grief and sorrow because they don't know the Lord. You need the Lord when you go through those times. Next thing. I'm probably talking to a lot of saved people here today. I know that we often take time in Sunday school to do this or right before Sunday school, but when's the last time you actually thanked the Lord for saving you? Taking you from being dead in trespasses and sins and giving you life. 
That had nothing to do with you. You realize that? We, we all kind of think about ourselves and all, and we think, oh, yeah, I'm doing all right. That has, your salvation has zero to do with you, amen? has all to do with what Jesus Christ did for you. Thank him for it. Next thing. Everybody here either has a mother or had a mother. Maybe your mother's not here anymore. Whether she's alive or not, how about you thank God for the influence your mother had on you? I know a lot of you, and I know the good influence your mother had on you, and maybe she had a lot to do with you being saved. Praise the Lord for that. Amen? Think, take the time to thank the Lord for your mother. The influence of a godly mother can be eternal. Amen. Last thing, I'll just say something to the mothers here. Mothers, have you taken the time to thank the Lord for the incredible responsibility he's given you as a mother? By the way, it doesn't matter how old your children are. It doesn't matter. It's still a huge responsibility. And it's an important responsibility. There may be some mothers here today that are greatly grieved because of the spiritual condition of their kids, just like this woman we read about. How about you take the time today to talk to the Lord and ask him to open the spiritual eyes and ears of your wayward child or children? Today would be a good day to take the time to do that. So let's bow our heads and pray together. Lord, thank you for this account. What a miraculous account we were able to read. Sure, thank you that we can know for certain that we have eternal life knowing Jesus Christ. I sure thank you for the mothers that are here. I'm so thankful for my own mother. I know there's many mothers here that just had great godly influences on their children and continue to do so. Lord, help our mothers. May today be a day of rejoicing for them. And I pray for our mothers that may be grieving for a myriad of reasons that you would strengthen, comfort, help them. And may they continually lean on you for assistance. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.